today. So I won't stand bright in the light here. Um, thank you for joining us today um, and for the talk by Kevin Ferguson Bonnie, a member of the Cornishan Indian tribe. I met Patty in January of 2005, um, and soon thereafter began collaborating with the tribe. Um, as some of you may know, in August of 2005, August 29th, Katrina hit New Orleans and Louisiana, and it was followed a few weeks later by Hurricane Rita, uh, which was more devastating for the tribe than Katrina. One of the consequences of these storms is that Tulane pivoted and created and expanded service learning courses. So some of you here today are taking a course that is service learning, and this is a result of those storms. Um, they made it mandatory. We were one of the first universities in America to make it mandatory to have to take those two classes, the lower and the upper tier of service learning. And also as a consequence of this, I immediately began to create courses that were service learning and with what became a community partner of Tulane, the Cornishan Indian tribe. Um, another consequence of that, and doing it so soon after the storm, is that Cornishan is probably the longest continuous partner of the Center for Public Service and Tulane University. Um, so we've been through a lot of good times, unfortunately some bad times. Hurricanes coast up in Ike in 2008, the BP oil spill in 2010 where the tribe was ground zero for that, and more recently Hurricane Ida. Um, I do want to take this opportunity to thank the Center for Public Service for all of their assistance and dedication over the years and especially this semester where they've been so critical in helping the tribe and um, the volunteers, the buses, everything that they've been doing for outreach. And including this Monday, November 1st at 7 p.m., we have a film with Chief Sherelle Parfait Dardar, Frank Kayu Dulac, um, Alexi Chidamacho Takchal, second chairman Donald Dardar from Quanishan, and Patty Ferguson. Um, which will then be followed by a live Q&A. You can find that information for signing up on CPS and Wave, and Wave Sync. So Plotishan took a direct hit by Ida, and this is not known, it's not sort of widely publicized in the media. Um, and for those of you who've been down there, you've seen the catastrophic destruction to that community and um, how the tribe is trying to deal with it in disaster relief. Patty today is going to talk about the federal recognition process, but also the larger consequences to tribal nations when you do not have federal recognition um, and all those obstacles that presents. So Patty Ferguson Bonney is a member of the Ponishan Indian Tribe. She's also the director of the Indian Legal Clinic and the director of the Indian Legal Program at Arizona State University. She has testified before the United States Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, most recently a couple of days ago. Yesterday. From, yesterday, from, um, from our study. <laughs> and the Louisiana State Legislature regarding tribal recognition and has successfully assisted four Louisiana tribes in attaining, um, for attaining state recognition. She has assisted in complex voting rights lit lit oh, excuse me, lit litigation on behalf of tribes, and she has drafted state legislative and congressional testimony on behalf of tribes with respect to voting rights issues. So please join me in welcoming her here today. Uh, I'm so glad to be here. Um, and first, before we get started, I want to see how many of you have been to Pornishan? Oh, oh my gosh, I'm so yeah. excited. Wait, wait, put your hands back up again. Let's see that. Wow, that is awesome. And I want to just thank you all so much for going out to our community and helping people, especially during this time period, because it really has been a blessing to people, especially when there are there's no one else around, right? It's only volunteers, so it's so meaningful. And y'all could have picked something else to do on the Saturday or different service learning. Um, so we really appreciate it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about the back 
background of the tribe, and then I'm going to talk about federal recognition and the process, what we've been going through, and then talk about some projects that we're doing to try to maintain community, cultural heritage in the face of everything that's happening, um, and then talk a little bit about Ida, but a lot of the pictures you've already seen, because you've been down there, so I'm going to spend a ton of time on it, and then I want to answer some of your questions. And so this is our tribal uh, symbol, as you can see, Palmetto Houses. Um, this is what we originally lived in, were Palmetto Houses. This also has hurricanes in the four directions. Hurricanes has always been a part of life in coastal Louisiana. These are alligator backs, like this. Alligator back, it's a uh, strong part of the alligator. And you can see as the winds are blowing, they're closer together. And then, and then they're further apart. And then, um, and then we have some fish, crab, uh, shrimp, and then paw prints because Pornishan is point of the dog. So that's, uh, that's Pornishan. So I just wanted to share a little bit of that with you before we get started. And as I was saying, initially, our houses were on the ground. So this is a picture of Pornishan from the 1940s. So everything you needed was provided for you by the earth. So you could live in Pornishan, you could make your boats out of cypress, you could grow crops, you would fish, you would shrimp. It was a self-sustaining community. And my mom um, was born in 1947, and her house was on the ground. She lived in a Palmetto house. So the change to the land has been very quick. And I think it's important to note this because a lot of people say, why do people even live there? Why do people live in Pornishan? And actually, Pornishan is one of the oldest and longest inhabited communities in Louisiana on the Gulf Coast. So this is another picture of another type of house in Pornishan. This is a mud and moss house with a palmetto roof from the same time period. Now, this is a picture of the land loss that you can see from 1932 to 2010. And we'll talk about, you can see the land here. And there's not as much land here. What is the difference in where the land was lost? Does anybody know? Can anybody tell? Anybody have an idea? Which area? What's the difference in these areas where the land is where the land is lost now and these areas where the land is maintained? So well, this, they have like more money in sudden so fish for levy production. Levies, yes. Levees, yeah. So these areas you can see are protected by levees, um, and so that has been a huge cause of uh, the loss of replenishing the earth every year that the Mississippi River deposited into the bayous. Actually, uh, Bayou Lafouche was called Lafouche des Chittimanches, the fork mm -hmm. of the Chittimanches, and it brought freshwater flow every year, redeposited topsoil, uh, and made you know, all of this land, habitable and fertile, but whenever the Mississippi River was diverted, then we lost that fresh water flow. So that was one of the issues that caused this land loss. Uh, but the other issue, you can see this now in red, what's happened, is the discovery of oil and gas in Terrebonne and Lafourche parishes, which resulted in a lot of development and exploratory cuts into the land, so you have no more freshwater flow coming out, and then you have cuts that are then bringing in salt water into your area, which makes the land that you live in uninhabitable. So we've lost many villages um, in these areas where people live. This is all our tribal community, uh, traditional community, uh, where people, so this is Lake Xi'an, named after Kona Xi'an, mm -hmm. Lake Felicity after <laughs> one of our ancestors, Old Lady Lake Lavie. Um, Lake Barre, so these are all of our traditional lakes. And now they're, it's pretty open. It's like almost to the Gulf, so it's a little bit dangerous. Um, and this is another example, you can see the picture. The top picture, this is the cutoff canal in Pornishant in 1907, and this is it in 2017. So you can see the difference, right? Uh, people, fished and lived further down the bayou. A lot of the villages where people used to live have already been abandoned because there's no more fresh water, you can't grow plants, you can't 
uh, feed your horses or cows, but they still have some horses and cows down in the lower portion. If you ever go for a boat ride, they have some down here. Okay, so we talked about this. Three main causes of the land loss are rerouting the Mississippi River, which we talked about, oil and gas exploration, which just left a lot of canals open, bringing in salt water. And then now that's compounded by climate change, uh, and see, which is subsidence and sea level rise. Now in the 1930s, I don't know how much y'all know about Pornish, I know you've been down there, but may not know a lot about the history. Our people were not allowed to attend school. So in the 1930s, which was about the same time as oil and gas development, there was the Baptist Mission School that opened a school for the children of Pornishan. So these are some of the kids, this is a little bit later though, um, and they're going to school in Pornishan. This is uh, the Baptist school, and this stayed this way. Um, there was a lot of efforts to try to have school for Indian kids in Terrible Parish, which the Terrible Parish School Board said, no, we are not gonna accept Indian kids into our public schools. There were schools for African Americans and there were schools for whites, but they did not have any schools for the native kids. And so finally, in the late 1960s, kids from the island filed a lawsuit, their parents, it was an attorney from New Orleans, filed a lawsuit to force integration of the schools. Because this meant that kids could not go to school past what was offered at the Baptist Mission School. Okay, so when my mom went to school, so my mom was born in 1947, so in the 60s, when this case was going on, she had to cross the bayou. Y'all have seen the bayou. There wasn't a bridge there before. So she'd get in a P road, cross the bayou, then someone had to drive her to Grand Bois, and then she would have to wait. She waited in a bar and took a bus <laughs> and went to La Rose Cut Off. So that was about a two hour trip every day, and only one of the kids who did that finished because the kids were so mean, they pulled her hair, they called her, they have some racist words that they call Indian down there and they would get in fight, so it wasn't, it wasn't a good time. So we had to fight to go to school. And so they then had Pornish Elementary School, which until May was about 70% Native American. And we have been asking for French immersion at that school. In 2018 and 2020, we filed petitions under Louisiana's law requesting French immersion. And the school board didn't respond. They ignored those requests. And then in May, they closed the school. So that's very sad. So this is a picture of our kids who are fighting to keep the school open. Aren't they so cute? <laughs> They're so cute. And Will was helping us with uh, Tele Louisiana. But we still have plans to still advocate for French immersion, whether it's a charter school or something else, because we think it's so important to our identity. And when they closed the school, the Terrible Parish Facilities Manager said, before closing the school, if you close the school, basically you're, clo <coughs> you're closing the lifeblood of the community. So they knew what they were doing whenever they closed the school and ignore our requests. Okay, I want to show y'all this video. I know some of you have been down already. Hopefully this works. No. <laughs> okay. There's a. You see that play button? You see a play button? Yeah. That's Sometimes if you exit the presentation mode, it'll. Six foot on the line, and you'd have a little hand net, 
and the, the, the line would just fall to the side of the boat and you just kick the crabs.
okay, well, we'll put you in touch with the tribal liaison for mass care feeding. And I said, well, well, they work with us because we're not federally recognized. And they said, well, that's, you know, all we can do. So I talked to the tribal liaison and of course they can't work with us because we're not federally recognized. So they said, well, you have to go through the state and we put in a request through the state. The state said we have to go through the parish. So the parish, you know, didn't put any requests in for us. At one point, I had the church request assistance from the Salvation Army because they would take requests from the church, but they wouldn't take a request from the tribe because we're not fairly recognized. And for me, I'm like, I don't care. People just need to eat. All people need to eat. I don't care if they're Indian or not Indian because whatever assistance we get is going to benefit everybody. Right? So no one's looking at this area, whether they're Cajuns or Indians, whoever they are. Um, so those are some of the challenges. And for example, with the BP oil spill, um, the Fish and Wildlife was assisting in the response. And we had sacred sites that were potentially going to be oil. Mm. And we set up a staging area to respond to that. And I asked for them to talk to us about this so that we could protect our sacred sites. And the person I talked to for Fish and Wildlife said, I cannot consult with you because you're not fairly recognized. I said, I don't care what you call it, but you have to talk to me. So call it whatever you want. But there's a specific consultation policy for fairly recognized tribes. We would be able to work directly with HUD. We would be providing government services to our tribal citizens. As y'all saw, the bayou divides Pornishan to two parishes. Lafouche and Terrible, which are two separate political entities. So, and there are not a lot of people who live in Pornishan. So, is there a lot of interest if you don't have a lot of political power because uh, your numbers are split and you're small anyway? Uh, there isn't a huge response. It's not a huge priority. Uh, language preservation and immersion, we would be able to get funding for a tribal school to um, assist with our language preservation protecting our fishing rights and subsistence rights. Donald, who you saw in the video, always goes to the shrimp meetings and is requesting the time that the shrimp should be open because the shrimp are growing earlier inland in the bayous and then they go out. But they keep pushing the time frame out, which means then they won't have an opportunity to catch the shrimp. So he knows this because he can see the changes, but they won't listen to him. Um, and then to help with maintaining our cultural traditions and community, and then of course, that's just the right thing to do, right? We should be federal recognized. Um, so there are different paths to federal recognition, uh, treaties, executive orders, court decisions, land settlements, the establishment of a reservation. In 1934, there was establishment of the Indian Reorganization Act where anthropologists went out and looked at people and said, do these people look Indian enough, should they? Um, apply for federal recognition. And they did have some come to Pornishan respond to this request and they said, oh, these people are very clean, which I don't know what that means. Like, what does that have to do with being federally recognized? And the federal government maintained an ad hoc list of who they uh, engaged with. So this was a problem. It was recognized as a problem. In 1978, the American Indian Policy Review Commission identified over 130 tribes that were not recognized due to bureaucratic oversight. They lacked treaties, they didn't have an allotment, there was never a reservation, and so these are some of the reasons tribes may not have recognition. Um, at the same time, the BIO was developing regulations, and at that time, they anticipated a one-year turnaround time, which that has never happened. Um, but these are the seven criteria for federal recognition. Um, you have to be identified as an Indian entity. You have to be a distinct community socially. You have to have a political community. You have to have a governing document to say how your tribe is organized and runs. You have to have a distinct membership. You have to descend from a historic tribe. And you cannot have been terminated. If any of you that do any Indian history, um, the federal government terminated a lot of tribes in the 1960s, so you have to go through Congress if you've been terminated. Mm -hmm. So since the time the uh, federal acknowledgement process started, 52 petitions have been resolved. Um, 18 have been recognized and 34 
tribes have been denied. There were 40 petitioners when the federal acknowledgement, acknowledgement process became effective, and there have been hundreds of new petitioners. There have been a lot of problems with the burden, the standard of proof shifting. Um, the standard is supposed to be reasonable likelihood. Is it reasonable that this, if we accept this information as true, that X or Y for what they provided, can we say that's reasonable likely that this would, that they meet the standard? But they, they enhanced it to be, we need conclusive proof, which becomes very problematic, especially in Louisiana. If you, how many of you are from Louisiana? Oh, not that many. Okay, so okay. <laughs> so there hasn't been a lot of primary research on Louisiana Indians. So the lack of primary research impacts the ability to prove information because they're looking for written documentation during all of these different time periods. There's also a lack of resources and a lack of transparency. I've submitted numerous FOIA requests that either were denied or they took years to be fulfilled. Um, and then you couldn't question their research methods or their research. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we, how our petition is situated. So, so I have to give you all a little bit of background. Um, there were, was two separate tribes that were formally organized in Terrible and Lafouche Parish. One was the Homa tribe and one was the Homa Alliance. And once the federal acknowledgement regulations uh, were adopted, they merged uh, to form the United Homa Nation. And then they filed a letter of intent in 1979 and their petition became active in 1991. Three years later, they received a negative proposed finding. They basically included all of the Indians who lived in Terrebonne and Lafourche in their petition. Um, and they met some of the criteria, but they couldn't meet social, or they didn't meet social, political, community, and historic tribe. Um, and these are some of the reasons, but what the government found, or what they said in their proposed finding, I will never say that their proposed findings are like, these are things that you should take as solid truth because you have an opportunity to respond to the proposed findings and they haven't had a, re a response. I think that they haven't had a full response analysis yet. So was there a difference between like the historical distribution of, or the distribution of the alliance versus the tribe or before the UHM? Yeah, one was in uh, Golden Meta okay. and one was in Greg Heidi Duet. Okay. So, so there were, were two all, separate bayous. What were, were y'all like one or the other? Like, no, we weren't part we of either of those. Because the date claim for was different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So there are a number of different bayous in Terrebonne and Lafourche Parish, and they have distinct communities on each bayou. And just to speak up again, so among those are, for example, Chief Shorel, Heart Bay Dardar, which is Grand Cayu Dulac. Bill Lexi, Chittimacha, Choctaw, Ilda John Charles, which is Chief Albert Nakan, um, and then Chief Randy Burdan, which is Bayou Lafouche, and Ponashen. And as the bird flies, these communities kind of all go across from each other, like if you were to go by boat. Um, but of course, as we drive, we go up and down each one of the sort of the fingers of land that still exists down there. And of those seven criteria, it's an all or nothing situation. So either you get all of them or you don't get um, recognition. So um, you can't get six, you can't get six and a half. You have to get all seven. That's right. And if y'all have questions, just raise your hand. I'm happy to answer it because this is, can be confusing. So, the, so in the UHN petition, they evaluated their petition from 1682 because at the time that their petition was being evaluated, they were looking at it from the time of first contact, which was 1682, which is before the United States existed, which is ridiculous. Um, and they have to prove that their ongoing existence since 1682, which is gonna be very hard to do because of the lack of historical record, which we don't need to go into here, but uh, there's, a, there's an issue with, with that. 
Um, they also claim descent from the historical Homa tribe, um, and they provided a timeline of that. But what the BIA said is that there wasn't a community prior to 1830. Um, they kind of said there were just some Indians, and they kind of got together in the bayous, you know, so they're unrelated, which is, uh, a, you know, a ridiculous theory. Um, and then they said from 1880, 1830 to 1880, there was a community in Montague. And then from 1880 to 1940, there were independent satellite communities. Um, but before 1907, there were no ethnographers or anyone else who had been to the lower parishes of Terrebonne and Lafourche to take any firsthand accounts of Native people. And I think that's important because the only information that exists in the written papers are, is that from someone else who comes in, and that's what the BIA is relying on. Now they did say they met political authority from 1830 to 1880, but from 1880 to 1940, the individual settlements, individual bayou communities meets the criteria. And then they met it for, once they were founded in 1972. Um, for their Indian ancestry, they, they said, yes, you have Indian ancestry. And they said 84%. It could be higher. I'm just going to note here that you have to have a birth certificate for every tribal member and people linking back to that historic ancestor to prove Indian ancestry. So if you're missing a part of the link, they're going to say that you don't meet it. So just because it says 84 doesn't mean that's 84. It could be much higher. They could just be missing some documents. <coughs> Um, and they didn't identify any specific tribe, but they did admit that they have three Indian progenitors. One is Biloxi, and then they identified Marie Gregoire of Takapa, which is not true. She's Chittimacha, but the BIA said she was a Takapa. Um, and again, the problems are that there's no primary research by historians. Mm -hmm. And at one point, one of the anthropologist said, oh, I figured it out. These people are Homa. And so they started calling all the Indians in La Ceremon Lafourche Homa. So what happened? Like, why aren't we part of the Homa's petition? Why is it different? Well, we are a distinct community. Um, the BCCM, which was made up of the three tribes that Laura mentioned, they withdrew from the United Homa Nation. And they created a confederation uh, to petition separately because the BIA said, hey, you could meet these criteria as separate political units. So that's what they did, and they withdrew. But we also withdrew, but we withdrew for another reason. One was we were fighting about relief money because people do fight. So we were fighting about relief money, and we actually went to a meeting um, that the UHN had, and we were protesting that. And in 1993, we filed an Aboriginal land title claim. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and we filed our own articles of incorporation before their proposed finding came out. And then in 1996, Congressman Tozan introduced a bill to recognize the United Home Nation in exchange for all land claims, which would have included our land also. It included any land if you descended from any of the progenitors that the UHN had, and we do have some shared progenitors. So. We were, people were fighting for the land. We have this lawsuit, um, which is called LLD versus Sydney Verdan. And basically, the oil and gas companies were trying to cut through a cemetery. And our tribal members went out there with guns and said, you better leave. And then the oil and gas, for the oil company, um, tried to get our tribal members arrested. So then we filed an Aboriginal land title claim. And the, the case was removed to federal court. And the federal judge said that the BIA has to determine whether or not we're fairly recognized before it would decide our lawsuit. So this lawsuit's been going on since 1993, right? So federal recognition is important. And since 1993, what has happened with our land? You know, what is the status of our land and the ability to protect that? Um, we, our petition became active in 2005. And we had been gathering information um, since the 1990s to submit. And we had a, uh, a genealogist, and she was very sick. She had cancer. 
And the rules were, if something was cited in a public work, you did not have to provide a copy of it. You could just provide a cite. Well, they changed that rule and said, no, you have to provide copies of everything that you're referring to. And we could not do that um, because we had two months to gather and submit our documentations when it went, once it went active. Um, and one of the challenges that we also had was whenever we met with one of the individuals who was working on our case at the BIA, they said they had come to our community before, but it was, she thought she was in a different community. And she had written up the proposed finding for UHN, so we were trying to get clarification as to what we should be doing. Um, do we have to go back as far as, as, as um, further than the other communities because they identified those independent satellite communities, but we weren't listed. Portachan wasn't listed, but other tribe, other communities were listed. Uh, we submitted our FOIA request, and what the BIA did, instead of us filing a new petition just with us, they said, well, you're responding to the UHN's petition, which, you know, wasn't good because then it held up the UHN's petition, and then we're responding to something that we don't even have documents on. So we didn't have access to their petition. We didn't have access to their obvious deficiency letters or any of their third party comments. And that's what we were trying to collect through the four year process. So this is just a little timeline of what we did and what we were able to put together in two months. Um, we received a negative proposed finding in 2008. Um, and 2008 was Gustav and Ike. And so we asked for our response to be delayed because they should have responded to our petition uh, in 2005, what we submitted in six months, and they didn't do that. They waited till 2008, and then we were responding to Gustav and I, and then the BP oil spill, which thankfully we were still pending because the revised regulations came out. Um, and so now we and the other tribes have each submitted a letter saying that we want to be evaluated under the new regulations. So. The new regulations seek to make the process more transparent, efficient, and fair. Um, there's a two-phased review, so if you don't meet historic tribe, you're out. So they look at four things initially. If you've been terminated, you're out. If you don't have a distinct membership, you're out. Um, but historic tribe for us is the main key. Um, there's a uniform start date of 1900. They have some new evidence, clarifies interpretation of some types of evidence, but it didn't clarify readable likelihood. Okay, this is ours. Uh, just so you can see the 2008 proposed finding under the old regs. You can see what we met and then what we partially met. We partially met, so I call it social community and political community, B and C, but we didn't meet historic tribe. And then when you change the regulations to 2015, we've now met social community. And this is what we need to prove for political community, 1941 to 1987, and then really from 2005 to the present, because that's when we turned in our petition and historic tribe. Those are the things that we have to focus on. And the historic tribe is like pre, like Louisiana, like Aha, uh -huh, we're gonna talk about that. Okay. <laughs> Cause that changed, okay? So this is what we're working on, updating our membership, verifying tribal ancestry for each tribal member, because you have to approve it for each tribal member, um, review all of our material to determine and explain historic tribes, identify our Indian ancestors, and we have to document it and explain all of this. And with our material, we want to create lessons plans that can be used in our school for our tribal community. Um, one of the things that they did, uh, identifying the guidance is that if something was used in a prior petition, any other petition, and was sufficient enough, then you can advocate for something similar, right? So if there were gaps that were allowable, then you can use those, you can have the same gap. If there was types of evidence that was used and that petitioner was successful, you can use that type of evidence. Um, and they identified eight tribes that you can look at, and there's two in Louisiana, Tuna Kablexi and Gina. Okay, so I'm gonna just focus on the criterion that we have to meet, but I'm gonna mention distinct community. This is how distinct community changed. I'm not gonna read it to you, but 
just to remind you that we did not meet it prior to 1830, and we met it from 1830 to 2005. So now, since it's 1900 to the present, everything came to 1900, we meet this. But, um, so we're good with that. And these are the types of evidence that you can use for social community. Endogamy, patterning out marriages, social relationships, discrimination, cultural patterns, collective identity, land set aside by the state, which we don't have, attendance at Indian schools, which mm -hmm. we did have, or if you meet political influence. So this is the one that we have to meet for certain periods of time. And what the BIA basically said is, we're not gonna assume that you meet it, you have to prove it to us, because you have people who are still alive during that time period, and you could do some oral histories. And so we did like 66 <laughs> oral histories, um, and we've been reviewing those, so our oral history committee um, was uh. tra translating and transcribing all of that information. And this was also changed in 1900 to the present. And so this is showing what your political authority or influence is in your community. So we did not meet this prior to 1830 um, or from 41 to 87. But we did meet it from 1830 to 1940, which means we meet it from 1900 to 1940. So these are our gaps. So we're like, we can do some oral histories. One of the things that they asked us specifically is how come nobody in our tribe was part of this Nakam versus Terrible Hair School Board case. But most of our tribal members lived on the Lafouche side of the bayou, so they wouldn't have a right to file a lawsuit in Terrebonne Parish. So we have to explain that to them. And we think by establishing a dogma and residence patterns that we could beat a lot of this. Um, so if you can allocate resources to so some of the similar things up from B, but if you can show this, uh, one of these, allocating tribal resources, settle disputes, organizer influence, economic subsistence activities, and you need to prove this in 10 year periods. So we're looking at it in 10 year periods. Or if you meet um, a distinct community under B, a certain part under B, which we'll talk about. Can you mobilize numbers of members? Um, are they involved in the political process? All of these things you can use to show political community. But this is the one that I think is important. If you can prove more than 50% of your members lived in a geographical location, or more than 50% of your members intermarried or have distinct cultural patterns, uh, it could be language, kinship, religious beliefs, or have distinct social institutions or kinship organizations, then you can meet that for different, different points in time. So we're thinking, well, we should map where people live, which we are trying to do. Uh, we can show that our language is distinct and actually people still speak it. We have a distinct culture, use our oral histories, and um, focus on intermarriage also. And I'll show you this. So this is 1940, marriages and Pornishia. So you can see during this time period that 79% are in, in dogmas, which means within the community. So the one thing that I just want to point out is before the regulations, if you had 10 tribal members and six, if three of them married three other tribal members, that's six of them, they counted that as three marriages. Mm. So if four married out, that was counted up as four married marriages. So you had more than 50% married out, right? But with the revised regulations, what we advocated for was no, if six people are married within the community and four people were married out, that means 60% are marrying within the community. And they accepted that in the change to the rule. But prior to that, they said, no, it has to, you know, that's only, we're counting it by marriage. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's so wild. So, and this is a breakdown of 1910 to 2000, basically. So you can see, um, once we get to the 80s, this is after the schools integrated, people started marrying, Marrying out, married other people. Once they, you're mingling. Hi, Geneva, when did you get married? 88. 88, that's one of those <laughs> But this is, we could use this for these time periods, the 40s, 50s, 
60s and 70s, right? So that's very helpful. And through that time frame, we think we can also show residency, um, which is very helpful. And in 2013, we had someone do um, an analysis for us, and half of our tribal members lived in the Pornishan community, which was the lower Pornishan community. And then some of the proposed findings, they, the, the span of where people lived was much greater. So we think like definitely for the 80s we could uh, prove that. And then we have many oral histories where we talk about like this is almost exclusively inhabited by native people. And then we also have oral histories that talk about um, the culture, the kinship system, the language. Um, and you can see this is a deposition in our LLD case. And they're talking about Indian French, where is it speak, spoken? Do each one of these communities have a distinct sub-dialect? Yes, they do. Is there one that's principally spoken only in Pornishan? Yes. Mm. You know, so just finding all that information and putting it together for 10 year time periods is what we're focused on. Okay, um, and this is also being able to, um, to protect your area. So things that you're doing to try to protect your area can be shown as evidence for political community. And some other tribes have used that. So Shinnecock used that also. Okay, so the next big um, area for us is to show descent. That we, that our membership consists of individuals who descend from a historical tribe or tribe that combined and functioned as a single autonomous political so this is the most difficult for any tribes in coastal, in the Mississippi Valley, I think, because of the lack of primary research. Um, this is how, how many members we had as of 2018, and each member over 18 has to consent in writing. So that's part of showing the descent and providing a birth certificate. So we have about 17% that are missing birth certificates. I'm just curious, with like, even in the last five years, the advances in genetic sequencing, can you use that to your advantage? Why not? I don't know, like, if they use it, like, to establish ancestry, right? It would show that you guys are all related, right? Yeah, no, because it does, just because you're related doesn't mean you descend from a historic tribe. That would right, mean... but if you can prove that <laughs> you descend from that person and this person's related to you, then that person descends from that person. <laughs> yes, write a paper on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hear, I hear what you're saying. I'm, just, I, I'm science and engineering, right? So these are the things I think about. Yes, right? yes. No, this has to be like paper. And the problem with hurricanes and storms is that people lose their paperwork. It is very expensive to get duplicate birth certificates. And some people were born at home. They were delivered. My mom was delivered by one of our um, uh, midwives and other people were as well, so uh, that can be difficult. Um, and if, and so when they're looking at, do you descend from historic tribe or tribes, they accept certain type of evidence, and this is what they accept. If there are federal, state, or official records, uh, church, school, or other similar enrollment records, records created by historians and anthropologists, in historical times it says, Affidavits of recognition by tribal elders, leaders, or tribal governing body, or other records of evidence. So to go to Will's question, do we have to prove this to 1689? Well, they had changed the guidance before to be 1789, because, you know, that's the year the Constitution was adopted. But in the new regs, you, you have to provide the most recent evidence prior to 1900. But in reality, you probably have to go further back than that to show historic tribe. So you can use records created by historians and anthropologists identifying the tribe in historic times or their conclusions drawn from historical records, which is really important uh, <coughs> because not many people have looked at these historical records. So Professor Kelly has gone to Spain. She's looked at all of these historical records that no one has looked at in Spanish and French and Tom went to Spain too. <laughs> They're reading all these records uh, because no one has looked at them. So I think people will be quite surprised with whenever her papers come out. This is what our breakdown is 
of our ancestry were primarily Chittimacha, and we have some Biloxi ancestry of in South Louisiana in the Mississippi River Valley, and it was normal for people to intermarry. Um, but the area where we are is historically Chittimacha, and there were a lot of uh, Chittimacha villages. Um, before I move on from federal recognition, I, I'm going to see if anybody has any questions. I know it's a lot of information. Um, what did you mean when you said earlier that uh, tribes were terminated? Yeah, the U.S. government terminated tribes in the 1950s, meaning they terminated the federal trust relationship. And they said you no longer receive any services. So in the U.S. Constitution, tribes are listed or identified in the U.S. Uh, Constitution, there's an Indian Commerce Clause, there's a way to negotiate treaties with Indian tribes. That's in the uh, U.S. Constitution, but when they terminate you, it means you're no longer a tribe for any federal purposes. And so they terminated a number of tribes um, in the 1960s. A lot of them have been restored, but some of them have not. But if they're terminated, they have to go through Congress to get restored. But the agency can't recognize you. Patty, okay. that's a good question. Okay. Um, can you explain what a satellite um, I think community is? Did I say that? I feel like I did say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Yeah. Um, I think what the BIA said was that the Bayou communities, the separate Indian Bayou communities, were satellite communities that can meet the criteria, the criteria separately, criteria, because I think it was political community, also social community, so criteria, but that those separate communities could meet those criteria, but that the UHN as a whole couldn't prove that they had social or political community across all of the Bayou. And a satellite community is just a separate community. Mm -hmm. That's that's what that's what you mean. But that's what you meant. That's what they mean. Oh. Mm -hmm. Did they did they mean like all of them specifically like one or They did not. That is the issue because they did identify us. They identified Ilder John Charles, Montague, Grand Cayuse, Dulac, Bayou Lafourche. They identified a number of separate satellite communities. And they talked about us, but they didn't list us. And that's why we were trying to get clarification for what we needed to do, since we weren't specifically listed, but they had been to our Does the closing of the school likely affect our petition? Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I think, I think it can only... I'm sure it's not going Yeah, it does show we have a lot of mobilization around that. I don't think it will negatively impact our petition. Um, I think, yeah, it could, it could show political community because everyone was organized. Plus, the French immersion petitions, the tribes submitted the petitions to the school board. So that would be, that would be a, not the voting as a positive, but the mobilization of that as a positive. So now, like Cornish has a school, um, it has like a cement roof, but they had a roof on top of it, and the roof on top of it came off. Um, and a lot of the schools got messed up in terrible parish um, with Ida. And we do have, there is a lawsuit that's currently ongoing to challenge the closure of the school that's in federal district court. But that case won't be heard until the summer. So that's not. Um, but because I think because of Ida, it was pushed off. Like the timeline was pushed off. Any other questions? Is there a difficulty with um, historic proof with like? Any I don't know how long, how far back off the top of my head, but he was identified as the chief of the Chittimachas. 
So he was identified as that. He talked to another individual who I think he mistook for siblings because there was a, there was a couple of Felicity Billiots. Um, and she explained who her grandparents were and where they came from. And so he made some assumptions, but then when he wrote his bulletin, he said, you know, these are homeless. Right, but his field notes were not reflected in what he wrote. And he actually wrote a letter to a lady in North Louisiana, Caroline Dorman, and said, I wasn't able to go back and look at all my sources before I wrote this, but the bibliography will be good. But, you know, I think he said something like, it will, it will be good for target practice or something like that. Other than the bibliography, it will be good for target practice. And other people who have actually written books on the historic tribes of Louisiana have not filled that gap. I was going to say also, um, John Swanton didn't speak French. Mm -hmm. So you had already one barrier of understanding. You have a translator. And then when you look at his field notes, which we have and are at the Smithsonian, um, and he writes it down, chief of the Chitimachos, this, this, all this stuff. And then he declared in an article published many years later that this was HOMA. And this was at a time, and up until 2015, where the BIA said, um, well, the experts are the ones that we rely upon. Not the oral histories, not the actual members of the tribe, but what did the experts say? And the experts said, John Swanton, you're Homa. And so it caused all kinds of cre uh, con confusion, but um, one of those changes that was brought about under the Obama administration in 2015 was recognizing that perhaps what the tribe members have to say about their own history is important and needs to be taken into consideration and as submitted as evidence. So hence oral histories and other things. Yeah, and then there was another individual, there was another anthropologist who did write a paper in 1917. His name is David Bushnell. And the title of the paper is the is it the Chittimacha of Bayou Lafourche? Did I make that up? Or no, the no, Indians no. of Bayou Lafourche? I think it's the Chittimacha. Okay, the Chittimacha of Bayou Lafourche. Sometimes I make things up, I'm trying to tell you. Um, but he, in that paper, the in person, he's interviewing one person, and he's talking about this conversation he's having with Abel Billiot, and Abel tells him he is Chittimacha. And he is learning all kinds of things and describing it in this paper. And the BIA says, oh, well, we need a field note. Like, we can't just take this paper as truth because we need the field notes. I'm like, why? You didn't look at Swanton's field notes. <laughs> and nobody in 1917 is lying about being something, right? You don't want to be an Indian in 1917 or in 1900. Like, nobody wants to be an Indian in that time period. And he was so, it was so clear that he was Chittimacha in this article. But then they said, well, we need his field notes. And we've been looking for his field notes. We cannot find his field notes yeah. anywhere. So why should we have that hurdle? But they've advised us that you should look for this, right? So we're going to try to look for it because they hold the key, right? So you try to want to respond to the person who has the power to decide things. So despite not having federal recognition, we still work on a number of adaptation and resiliency projects. And these are some of them here. That's not all of them. But obviously, we've elevated our home since Katrina, Rita, Gustav, and Ike. We have a community garden outside of our community because of the saltwater intrusion. We're working on a medicinal garden. Right now, it's a relief supply holding location because of Ida. We do have a bulkhead safe harbor that we put up where people can tie their boats. We have a grant we're working on to backfill some oil canals. Um, and we have an oyster stabilization project. I'm going to show you pictures of that. Of course, we're working on French Immersion. We have an annual culture camp. Um, there's now been a floodgate put in, and the levee system may be complete in like two years. So at least flooding will help people who live in the current village. The floodgate? Yeah. The floodgate, if you go down Cornishan, there's a gate right before the cutoff. Oh, okay. And they close it whenever the water's coming in. Are you sure you're on the intercoastal? Are we trying to get on Would the you intercoastal? Like to have one in the intercoastal? Like a, like 
like the eight to mega press one? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. no, Teresa, so I don't I don't know. <laughs>
So I just want to talk about Ida real quick. I know I'm running out of time because uh, I want to I want y'all to be able to ask some more questions. But this is the radar of Ida, 3:12 p.m. You can see that it's going to Pornishan. and this is the Irma um, map, which is the Environmental Response Management application from NOAA. Mm -hmm. It shows the the location of the storm and where they take pictures. So this is Pornishan over here, right here. So the storm is going through here and there's no pictures, but there's pictures all around. And so I just bring that up because I'm watching the storm. I'm in Arizona and I'm watching the storm. I'm like, oh my gosh, people are sending me pictures. The storm is totally gonna hit Pornishan. And I'm like talking to my family, we're all sending texts and then it lands in the, the first landing was in Port Fouchon, and the second landing, no one ever said the second landing was, was in Pornishan. Mm. No one ever said that. If anyone ever heard that, let me know. Show me where you said that. Someone said on the Weather Channel, they said, and the second landing was here. You know, this point, it wouldn't even say anything. You know, but I think that is so important <clears throat> because if you're not visible, and people aren't aware, then there's not gonna be a response. And you can even see this by these federal flyovers and pictures, but they're not going in our area. So then why would there be a response? We're not even talking about you. Uh, but I think it's very harmful to be invisible. All right, so just to keep this, just to make this really clear, because you may not be able to read it, the purple is where they took photos. So look where the storm is and look where the photos are. And if you try to look at these maps, you, you can't find anything. It's just like grayed out. And I've got some other ones that show where it's getting in closer or it just goes straight up at 665. But yeah, so again, if you're looking at all this, you're looking at communities far removed and none, not Gilda John Charles. Not yeah, Gilda John Charles is right here. Yeah. And uh, wiped out. Where you see 665, that's that's the road when you drive down to Corner Shen the bayou on each side. And so this is Pornishan after Ida. I know that y'all have seen it. This is um, an aerial view. And this is a week after, and there's still water here because the parishes on both sides run the pumps. And on one side, I think they didn't put fuel in the pump. Terrible. Mm -hmm. And the other side, um, I don't know if the pump was broken or something or they didn't turn it on. So, you know, this is what, so there was still water in people's yards and they're trying to go back. And you can see, well, y'all seen these houses, but you can see in that one that, where there's water still in the yards. And of course the tribal members were the ones who actually cleared the road so people could get back there because there still hasn't been anyone down there to clear the roads or do anything like that. This week there was some debris pickup um, for the first time, so that's two months in, right? There's finally some debris pickup, but I think as y'all can see, like there are people who have started burning things because they're not picking it up and there still needs to be more demolition and things to be, people still haven't gone through all of their items because there's no place to put things. Okay, so I wanna just talk about this house, because this is a problem with uh, FEMA. So the person at this house, FEMA said, okay, you get $4,000. Your house is destroyed, I think $4,000 is what you get. So I think that we're gonna have a hard time. The max is 36, but with rebuilding in our communities, you can see the houses, like all the roofs, that are gone, right? So we know that we need to do something to hard and roofs and structures. But, you know, $4,000 is not. Has, has FEMA, has FEMA like, made a reason for that behavior over there? Well, for, for hers, they're not giving her money for the house. They're only giving her money for the contents, but I think like 2,000 was for rental assistance and 2,000 was for her contents. Um, or it could be off, maybe it's 6,000 total with 4,000 for, for the contents. But they're not treating her as the homeowner. They changed the name of this road um, from Lower 665 to Oak Point Road. On the assessor's website, her house is still listed as Lower 665. So I don't know 
if that's why, but for whatever reason, they're not treating her as a homeowner. And we have a number of people on the Lafu side of Pornishan who live on family property who are having problems with making claims. Even though FEMA has announced that they have are recognizing airship properties and that you can apply. They did make that rule, I think, right before uh, the storm. But yeah, so she's gonna have to appeal, right? She's gonna, hopefully, we'll get assistance in appealing um, so that people can advocate for this. And the problem right now is that it took a month for people to get electricity and water back, right? But people still, you still have not very good, that good of phone service down there, and you don't have any internet, uh, any internet service at all. How does something like FEMA you know, assistance have sex with like homeowners insurance or whatever? Do you have access to that? I'm just thinking like when I moved here, the company I had my insurance with was like, no, we don't do homeowners in Louisiana, and so I had to go to someone else. Like, do you, yeah. do you get cut off like where insurers are like, no, we're not even going to insure you? Or well, I would, I would say, like, for our tribal building that I showed you a picture of where y'all went, to get wind insurance for that building, which is 1,200 square feet, was $12,000 was our quote for that. Like, who can afford $12,000? A year. A year. That's for a year, yeah. right? So most people, there are a few people, but most people in lower Cornishan do not have insurance. And that's wind, that's not flood. And another uh, family, they have a really high house. They elevated their home and uh, they applied for FEMA and they were denied FEMA. No, they applied for an SBA loan and they were denied an SBA loan because they didn't have flood insurance. But their house is 12 feet in the air, mm. so they shouldn't need flood insurance. So they were denied SBA, which is 1% loan. It's really um, low cost, which would allow you to get money to rebuild but they gave them the max for FEMA. <laughs> they were like, how does that make sense that they're giving me money when I'm willing to borrow the money so that I have enough to rebuild my house? And they said, no, because you don't have flood insurance. And they're like, but I don't need flood insurance. And I want to just reiterate that all of this has to be done online. So, wow. so you have to do it wow. online, you have to do it with no internet, which means you have to travel somewhere. Um, you have to think about the elders who are doing, well, first you create an account, then you need an email, then we'll email you the information, and then you need to respond to the this and that. And you can see where more and more and more hurdles come um, just to try to get simple answers or denial. Yeah, so my uncle called me one day because he couldn't register. Because you could call, but you have to wait a long time yeah. to get a response. And he's like, can you register me? I'm like, yes. Give me your bank account number and I will <laughs> over the phone. <laughs> so, so I did, you know, but you can't, you have to, somebody you trust has to be able to do that for you. But I was just kidding with them. I said, I'll just put my bank account, but I didn't. And, and then just also, uh, when you log on to the website, and I consider myself pretty tech savvy, the PIN situation, and then it sends it to your email, and you got to go to your email yeah. to then get the PIN, and then, wow. I've changed mine like five times because it's just such a process. Yeah, and yes. if you have an account from before, like Gustav Ike or Katrina, um, they kept, like my sister had this whole issue, and they were like, nope, nope, and they were going back, if you already have an account, that's wrong, you know, I mean, and it's, yeah. that's here in New Orleans, and again, tech savvy with internet mm -hmm. and everything else, and it's hours of frustration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's bad. And with the temporary housing situation, the state has received money from FEMA to allocate funds for temporary housing. But the, the parish received names, we sent them our names, and the parish said, okay, we're gonna forward those to the state. The state said, yeah, we have the names, don't worry about it, y'all don't have to re-sign up. And then, you know, a Sunday ago, the state said, no, you have to sign up now. And so I have to tell, elders now you have to sign up okay I called and then they said they're gonna they gave me a username they have to get online and I have to sign up but I don't have a computer and they don't have any translators <laughs> working in these phone lines but even if you call they're making you go to the computer to in, you know input a username and password and no one has internet no one has internet no and again to go back to the federal recognition issue because 
if Ponashen was federally recognized, so much of this red tape and these hurdles, it wouldn't exist. You'd cut straight through that because you'd be having government to government discussions, you'd have an immediate you know, sort of access, resources, and everything else, um, and really couldn't be denied and ignored in a way that happens, is happening right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Um, this house, I just want to show you this house, because from the outside you could go, you know, that doesn't look that bad, right? That maybe like the side came off, but that doesn't look that bad. But this is the inside of this house, and this is the view looking out, and this is the inside. It's like it was an explosion in there, right? So if you see the outside, you know, of course, next door the trailer's down. Um, and this is just on the right side. This is the debris that y'all have seen on the road. But this is the impact of not having water and people not being able to clean anything. Is that then you have, even where you have walls that remained or whatever, that there was still, you know, could be some roof over it. You have that <coughs> black mold growing and then you can't save that. You gotta like cut all that. You have to cut all of that out. Um, so in our recovery and rebuilding phase, we're still at debris removal. Like we still are at the cleanup process. We still need them to come pick up the debris. Um, we need temporary housing. We're, you know, asking for that. People are signing up for it, um, trying to to work on that because people need a place to live so that they can, you know, be secure and ha be able to work on their house. We need demolition and repairs, and then we really need designs for resilient mm -hmm. housing structures. Because if people, if they rebuild, or if they build a new house, and their house isn't resilient, it's not going to withstand the wind, then that doesn't make any sense. We know after Katrina, we built a couple houses, because we had a little bit of funds. We built two houses in our community, and two houses each in some of the other tribal communities. And all those houses withstood the storm. So that can be done. But we need different designs so that we can help people, you know, say, instead of just, let me put something together and because I need a place to live. No, look, here's a design, you know, and then we need to try to fundraise for the building material and supplies for those to offset, you know, the 36,000 or the zero. I'm just going to go back to this house because this homeowner, this, this door is now gone, so it's open. This homeowner got a call. She got a letter from FEMA and said that, um, she, her case was being closed for her failure to respond. And she called them and she said, what do you mean? I've been, I've been calling you every day. And they said, yeah, but we went and knocked on your door and you weren't there. Uh, <laughs> she was like, this door's gone now. Like it's been gone. And she goes, what? I don't even have a door. So, <laughs> you know, this is problematic. And then of course, labor and assistance for rebuilding because the amount that people are going to get from FEMA isn't going to be enough. But, you know, I do think we should be advocating for more resources into our frontline communities. Um, and then, of course, thank you to everybody for volunteering. That's awesome. I only have two pictures. I know we have a lot more weekends, but I couldn't fit as many pictures on here. Um, and that's it. Other ways to help. We have Louisiana Coastal Tribes that has the other tribes on there. And then our tribal website. <coughs> So now I still left nine minutes for questions. <laughs> um, I don't know if I'm the only one here, but this process when you were reading the different guidelines and all of this, I got this sneaking suspicion that this is a card game with the cards that seriously against the Indian. I mean, it's like bizarre, there's this entity coming in, it's like we're invaded from space and we're all here, and then we
prove that what you are, what we want you to be. <laughs> How can this even hold up in any court? Ah, <laughs> well agencies have a lot of discretion and that's the challenge, right? Because it's, the federal acknowledgement process is not authorized by a specific statute. It's only through these regulations and under you know, administrative law, agencies have a lot of discretion. Now in the new regulations, you can challenge their findings. In the old regulations, you could not challenge their findings. Challenge their authority? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but I like where you're going with this. <laughs> but I, I, I will agree with you. It is. It's just because they change the standard, it doesn't mean that it's not tough. It's the same regulations, just with a different time frame. But for, for historic tribes, you still have to go back and do the work, and it's a, it's very. Difficult, especially now you're looking at things a couple hundred years old that no one has ever looked at or analyzed. And they're going to be shocked. So, is it all about evidence or the evolving count? What was the second part of your question? Is it all about evidence or is it going to lobby the government you know, so beyond the evidentiary? Yeah. So, you could. You, one route is to go through the federal acknowledgement process, which is the administrative process, the Office of Federal Acknowledgement. Another avenue would be Congress. And you would really need your state senators to be on board to introduce those bills. Your, both of your senators would have to be in favor of that. And there have been tribes who've been recognized. There have been more tribes recognized through the congressional process since the process began than through the administration. Well, and so now if you're talking about, you know, the Senate and Congress, so you said earlier that there's your, there's a voting rights litigation. So now if there's an issue with voting with the, the tribe, is that, uh, maybe that's... Did I say voting rights litigation? Somebody, there was a oh, voting I work on voting issues. On, yeah. Oh, but not for the tribe. Well, for different tribes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because I was just thinking if you're trying to get to... Uh, in the like Congress and, and talk to them and if there's an issue with voting rights I can only imagine how that would further just exasperate the issue as well but if it's for another tribe never mind when voting rights came up earlier I was like oh no that's just an even bigger issue then. well I think the, the issue maybe that you're identifying is that the political strength mm -hmm. and that's why we right, partner yeah. with our Bayou you know our sister tribes some of the Bayou tribes uh, because you know 800 people is not very many to wield, you know, political authority <laughs> or influence um, government decision making. But, you know, if all our friends want to help us do that, I would be okay with that. <laughs> Anybody else? Have oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Um, so how long did it take after previous storms to get under and not to be stable homes and also, like, where are people living in that? So she asked, um, how long did it take in previous storms, Katrina, Rita, Gustav Ike, before people got back in? And more immediately, where are people living right now? Because we are now approaching nine weeks, um, and there are, you know, the FEMA trailers, the ones that she spoke about, that you know will sign up again, and this and that. They're still waiting for delivery on this. So, I don't know if you want to start. With so the yeah, I mean, I'll give you an example for. Katrina Rita, for Rita, um, my uncle flooded, and then he rebuilt his house, but everyone was elevating, so that was 2005, and he was, in 2008, his house was redone, but he was next in line to elevate, and his house was not elevated before Gustav Ike, so then his house was destroyed, you know, well, it was flooded again, so then he had to cut all the walls out and all the floors out again, and then he elevated. And now with this storm, his roof came out, and the whole thing uh, messed up. I don't remember how much time. I think it was a couple years, um, you know, to to get that done. Um, well, he had fixed it, but he hadn't raised it yet because there was such a demand to have house elevation, and there was some funding for that through the road home program that 
uh, Louisiana had some federal funding that they were managing to help elevate homes. Okay. Yeah. I could follow up on that question. Well, I think for a lot of us, we don't have a lot of context for having, like most of us have not ever been displaced. So even if the home's not completely rebuilt, like at what point is it livable again? In other words, so some people are in their homes and they should not be in their homes because they don't have anywhere else to be. So some people are in their homes, there's mold in their homes, there's, you know, or they, my aunt is living in my grandma's house and she's, she is sleeping in that house and there are no walls on the interior of the house, right? It has a blue roof on it, uh, tarps on it, and there are big gaps to the outside, yeah. but that's where she's sleeping, right? Other people are staying with other family members and there are some people, because people don't want to be that far away, right? People don't want to be that far away. Some people are further away. Some people are renting houses a little bit further away uh, so their kids can go to school and things like that, but uh, people don't want to be that far away. There was a yeah, question over here. Uh, sleeping in the church. Okay, they have like two people sleeping in the church, like in rooms, like just rooms in the church. They put up air mattresses. There is a like a base camp, I think what it's called, which is the next town over, but I don't think any of our tribal members are staying there. It's like a 200 person camp. They put eight to 14 people in a tent, um, but there's none in our community. There's nothing like that in, in our community. There were people who were like sleeping and, you know, people were converting sheds. It's like they're buying a shed. Or they're converting a shed into, you know, like a tiny house or something to, to stay in. I mean, people long ago didn't live in big houses, so I, you don't have to live in a huge house, but, you know, moving forward um, with the types of storms that we're getting and the increased, um, you know, it, the, the Gulf is getting warmer, the storms will be more intense. We are now the barrier if you don't have a buffer you're gonna get more of that wind. And if you have to elevate, you're gonna catch more of that wind. So you need something resilient, something that's gonna withstand those winds. But yes, yeah, so people are displaced everywhere. Some people are staying where they should not be staying. Some people are moving around to different family members' houses to give people a break. At one point, I think there was a family from the island that had, um, was hosting other members who were from the island, like 18 people in their home. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of love. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, I gotta go. <laughs> I'm outside now. <laughs> and I think it's five o'clock, so we'll end it on a message of love. <laughs> <laughs> Thank y'all so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>